the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. See all the ashes, you see the beauty. Oh, oh. when all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty tomb. So, when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And everywhere I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. There is a truth that's older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. And there is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. And there is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. He roars like a lion. He bled as the lamb. He carries my healing in his hands. Jesus. There is a name I call in times of trouble. There is 
is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. He is Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. He was like a lion. He played as a lamb. He carries my healing in his hands. Jesus. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer. There is power in your name, in your name. Let us continue in great praise together this morning. Our Savior is alive. He is our peace. Ah. Uh -huh. 
same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand in face. Yes, I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy. Heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, yes, I praise the name, Lord. I see the Holy One, high and exalted. 
exalted. I hide my eyes and I tremble before Him. I tremble, Almighty, tremble in the presence of Your Majesty. Your whole the King of Kings, Almighty, we're humbled in the presence of Your Majesty, Your Holy, You alone, the sovereign crown of royalty, You're the King of Kings, Almighty. Last week, as I was reading scripture for the Tuesday Bible study, uh, a biblical assessment of Catholicism, I was struck by something that I hadn't thought about before. Jesus used two completely different styles of evangelism in his ministry. One, when he was talking to sinners, and the second one, when he was talking to religious people. You see, Jesus was a great religious figure. I mean, he's the Messiah. That's his claim. And you would think that he would be accepted by the religious community, which he was not. Because this is a community that's devoted to the Old Testament scriptures, which are all fulfilled in Jesus. And the religious community showed Jesus little respect but he showed them even less. The way that he talks to them is completely different than when he talks to sinners. Now, the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The woman at the well, you've had five husbands. The man you're living with now is not your husband. I offer you living water. Two of the despicable tax gatherers Zacchaeus and Matthew, he invites them to come and be with him and follow him. It's an amazing thing. There's such a kindness. But Jesus does not evangelize religious types the same way at all. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. We'll start at verse 14. This sort of gives us a context of where we're going. It says, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. So we're talking about the crowds in general. But then it says, but some of them said this, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. That's very interesting because the people who first accused Jesus of that are the Pharisees, and that's in Matthew 12. 
and Jesus went into an explanation. But now a lot of other people listening, being influenced by the religious leaders, are saying, yeah, I think he just does that through the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding he give them a sign from heaven. And it says, but he knew their hearts or their thoughts. And he said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. The same thing he had said before. He wants to be clear about this. As Jesus then goes on in verse 23, he makes a really profound statement. He said, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Comes to Jesus, there's no Switzerland. No one's neutral. You're either for me or against me, and there's no other option. That's all there is. He wants them to understand that very clearly. And so after he does that, then he rolls down and he says that, uh, he said in verse 27, while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised their voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you were nursed. She meant that as a compliment. Jesus wasn't impressed. Interesting. He said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Wow. I mean, depending on her religious background, she just said, blessed be the queen of heaven, Mary herself. Jesus said, on the contrary, blessed are people who hear the word of God and observe it. It's interesting in light of where religion ended up taking us. But that's what he said. It's almost prophetic in, its, in this encounter. And notice where the real authority is. On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God. There's the authority according to Jesus. And as the crowds were increasing, he said to them, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and I'll give it no sign but the sign of Jonah. So now he pronounces the fact that this is a wicked generation. And you want to think how wicked? Well, look what he says. He says in verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up uh, with the men of this generation at this judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. You know what he's saying this? By the way, in another passage, he said uh, the other group will stand up and condemn you this religious generation, Sodom. Sodom will condemn you. Nineveh, the terrible one said, they'll condemn you. Jesus is saying, look, you're worse than any of them. That's his point. You're worse, not better. And we always think, no, you can't get worse than the Assyrians. You can't get worse than the Sodomites. You can't get worse than that. He goes, oh, yeah, you can get much worse. You see, the idea being, you can't get worse, you can't get worse than really sinning overtly. He said, yeah, you can. You can get religious. It's worse. You see, that's Jesus' point. It's a, it's, a, it's a profound point when we think about it from that point of view. He says to him then, no one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar uh, nor under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the lamp. The eye is the lamp of your body, and when your eye is clear, the whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Then watch out. He said, watch out that the light in you is not darkness. He said, if therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark, no dark in it, it will be wholly illumined. And when the lamp illumines you, it will do it with its rays. <laughs> it's an interesting thing that he's saying. The problem with this generation is not light. The problem in generation is not your eyes. The problem in this generation is inside you. You're dark. You're black. I'm the light of the world. I'm talking right to you. I'm the son of God. It means nothing to you because you're dark on the inside. So after he had said this, now we get a context here. He says, now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and he reclined at the table. Wow. A Pharisee. And it seems as though he just wants to know more. Let's have, and that would be brunch here. Uh, not, it would be called brunch. Late morning, recline at the table, 
Other Pharisees are there. We'll see in a moment. Other people are there. But he said, could we have lunch? Jesus said, sure. See, they, he got criticized because he ate with prostitutes and sinners, but he says, look, it's even worse. I eat with Pharisees. You know, I'll even do that. And so he, he did it. And it's really interesting. <laughs> he said, uh, when the Pharisee, it says, he reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he did not ceremonially, continually wash before the meal. Wow. Isn't that something? This is amazing to me. He has some interest here, but this guy is going to reveal his hand right in the very beginning. That's exactly what happens here. The Pharisee says, look, you did, th this can't be right. He's not clean. You see, he's a Pharisee, and we use that term all the time, by the way. It comes from parash. The Hebrew word parash means separate. And uh, ever since the time of Arani lied of Ezra, about 400 years, the Pharisees have continued to grow. Uh, the Pharisees are laymen. Uh, they're not priests of Levi. They're nothing like that. They're, they're laymen, devoted to the Old Testament and the Word of God. Um, there's about 6,000 of them in Israel at the time of Christ. So a lot of Pharisees uh, in the time. And the one thing they did is they're always adding to the law. Uh, the, their view is the more laws you have and the more you abide by it, the more righteous you are. It's just simply a story of religion. They are sort of religion on steroids. Uh, that's kind of who they are. And so he does it, and Jesus doesn't wash his hands. Now, you've got to understand, first of all, this. Not one verse in the Old Testament says you need to wash your hands before you eat. Not, not a verse. They don't need a verse. Religion never needs the Bible to support it. Even people devoted to the Old Testament don't need it. We'll just add things to it. And you had to wash your hands in a very particular way. According to the Mishnah, you're only allowed to have one and a half eggshells full of water. Only one and a half. I don't know how they did this, but then you took the broken egg and you poured it over the tips of your fingers and let it run down on your hands and arms. That is ceremonially making you now clean. And if you're not ceremonially clean, you're violating God. Because who knows? You may not have touched the Gentile, but what if a Gentile touched somewhere and you, you put your hand there? You're unclean. So no matter what, you have to ceremonially clean yourselves. It's an, it, it, it seems really odd to us, but it's nothing new. In uh, Matthew 15, it says, Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. This is big. Jesus said, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of tradition? For God commanded you to honor your father and mother. They don't. They find a loophole, you see, so they didn't have to honor their parents. And they could take that and say the money, all, everything in their estates dedicated to God in the temple, and so their parents can't have any support. Jesus says he has, a, he has an aversion not just to religion but tradition. Jesus isn't about anything like this. He's only about truth. That's all he does. But these religious people understand this, and I keep telling you this. If you were a Jewish family, you would pray your daughter would marry a Pharisee. They have the, they have the best reputation in the country for being close to God. They are devout, moral, scrupulous people. They had incredible moral sensibilities. Jesus detested them. It's amazing. You see, religion blinds people to the truth. Religion immunizes you against the real disease. That's what religion does. Religion will cover your sin with ritual and external morality. And Jesus is extremely upset by all of this. And so, after that happens, the Lord said to them, Now you Pharisees, he said, Now you Pharisees, he said, Clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. But inside you, you're full of robbery and wickedness. 
You say, wow, that's pretty harsh. No, it's not. What is Jesus telling them? The same thing he'd tell all people everywhere at all times. It's the same thing. That's the whole point. How many righteous are there? How many have sinned? All have sinned and fall short of the good. There isn't anybody like, there is no one else like this. And not, no matter how religious you look, you're not. The difference is the woman caught in adultery, the woman at the well, or most people, tax gatherers, they have no trouble identifying they're a sinner separated from God. But a religious person, they do. You see, that's the point. Religion will do this to you. That's what religion does, and that's what Jesus is saying. Look, if you look inside, look what you really like. Then he says something that's a little bit shocking. You foolish ones. You fools. Now, the reason that's so shocking to me is that in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, the, Jesus said, don't call people fools. <laughs> Apparently, unless they are. He said, don't call people fools. The word is aphronis. It means simpletons. It's the idea of being a fool. Paul said in Ephesians 5 to us, don't be foolish. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2 to uh, 15, uh, that we may silence the ignorance of fools. See, it all begins on the inside. He says, you are a fool. Did he who made the outside also make the inside? Don't you get this? Don't you understand this? They never have. Think of this. When the early church got launched, Judaizers, who were believers in Jesus, went to Galatia and told the Galatians, you, you, you can believe in Jesus and that's okay, but you'll never get to heaven and be with God unless you're circumcised. I mean, that's that right away. We're going to put a religious edge on this. We'll make it religious. But you know what? It's in the Old Testament where Moses writes, the real circumcision is the circumcision of your heart. You see, circumcision was just an outward sign. It didn't have any value spiritually, except it revealed that you're the people of God. But the circumcision in your heart, that's all that's really going to matter. That's the only thing that's going to change anything. Jesus said, but give what you, he said, that which you wish within uh, all charity, then all things are clean for you. He uses, an, it's an interesting verse. Uh, some of the commentators struggled with the interpretation of it. But he is saying, when it comes down to even the idea of how you give, it can only mean how you're motivated on the inside. Nothing else has any bearing at all. Nothing. Well, they didn't believe that. They didn't believe that at all. Remember, they, they were pretty interesting guys. Uh, when Pharisees gave, they waited till the temple grounds were full, and then Jesus said they, they had a trumpet, now, I don't know if it was literal. And they would want everybody to know, like, here it is. And then they'd walk over and then, look at me. Just look at me. Look what I've done. Wow, that seems kind of crazy, but it's true. Think of Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler. You want to see the heart of religion, there it is. Jesus took a little bit different evangelistic route here. What did Jesus do? He said, well, what do I do to have eternal life? What a great lead question, right? You think you're going down the Roman road. Jesus, I love this, keep the law. Rich young ruler. I'm in. I always have. I keep everything. Really? Yeah. You see that? You see how naive, you see what religion does to your soul? I've kept it all. Liar. You see, he's just bold-faced lying. But Jesus wanted to expose that. That's the religious heart. The religious heart is always, I always do enough to be with God forever. I do this. My religion proves it. Jesus is not buying that at all. So Jesus said, good. Well, let's move from the outside to the inside then. Then get rid of it, sell everything you have and follow me. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You see, what is he full of? Greed. I, what? I'm not selling everything. I'm not doing that. No, you're not. See, that's the whole thing. That's the way this whole thing works. God 
wants only the inside of all of us. Nothing you do on the outside, unless it's backed up by the inside, means one thing to God. Amos, the great prophet, said this. I love this. Stop your songs. It's a great line. Stop your songs. I don't want any more of your songs. Stop your sacrifices. I don't want any more sacrifices. Why? Your hearts are not right. He said, when you get your heart right, you can sing again. Don't do this. Don't, don't mock me. You see, the idea of religion is so external. It's always based on how we see each other in an external way. And Jesus says, no, don't do that. Religion emphasizes the external, and it neglects the internal. And it does it everywhere for all time, and it's doing it today. It's just the way it always works. Secondly, religion majors on minors and minors on majors. That's his point. Because he's going to start now and give three of these woes. He said, but woe to you, Pharisees. You pay, you pay a tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet you disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. Huh. They major on the minor. The word woe there is a word of judgment. When you see Jesus saying woe, he doesn't mean woe, like slow down. He means this is judgment. So he says, woe to you, Pharisees. They love the secondary things. <laughs> they tie the mint and a rue. I find that really interesting. I had to look up what a rue was. I don't know if you did too. But it, and by the way, the Mishnah, the Jewish work on how to be a good religious Jew, says never tie the rue, but they tithe anyway. But they tie, they tie the mint. And I think they find that extremely funny. What should have they been doing? I love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm, we don't need that. We can, I want to show you that. Do you tithe? I tithe a mint. A mint. You give, give me that mint. I'm going to pull one-tenth of that leaf off. That's God's. You see? Look what, look what I've done. I tithe that. By the way, you have to be careful with all that. That's why Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, a hilarious giver. Don't give out of necessity. See, don't give. Be careful with that. Christians are terrible. I've said it over the years. I'll say it one more time. Christians tell me they often they want to be very, very biblical, and so I tithe. Okay, that's what you want. But then be biblical. You do realize that if you take the Old Testament tithe, there are three of them. <gasps> really? Yeah, really. There's three tithes. There's one tithe you do every single year, and you tithe one-tenth of your wine, grain, oil, uh, and your flock. You give it to the Lord, one-tenth. Also, every year, you tithe for the national festivals in Israel. They have festivals all year round. Every Jew tithes. Okay? And every third year, you tithe again on top of those two. And that's every third year, it goes, that, all that money goes to the poor, the widows, and the orphans. It's 23 and a third percent. And in the Old Testament, then, when you give, you give above the 23 and a third percent. So please don't tell me you're a tither. A biblical tither. You can tithe if you want, that's fine. But a biblical tither, because that's not what the Bible teaches. You see, that's the way they saw it. Hold your place here and go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Just to show you, this is back Moses writing in the first five books in verse 12 in Deuteronomy 10. Here's what Moses writes. He said, now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? Can't be more straightforward. What does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and love him and serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes which I am commanding you today for your good. He says, Behold, 
to the Lord God belong heaven, the highest heavens, the earth, and all that is in it. Yet your fathers did, he said, the Lord, he said, yet on your fathers the Lord did set his affection and love them. And he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples as it is in this day. So, what? Circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. Right back to the inside and the spiritual. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords and the great and the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and he shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, you who were aliens in the land of Egypt. Now that's clearly what God is saying. Now by the time you get to religious Judaism at the time of Christ, Pharisees wouldn't even talk to an alien. You don't even go near Gentiles. We want nothing to do with these folks. Well, God said, I want you to take care of them. We're not taking care of them. They're unclean by our religious standard. So you sort of get this idea of what he's talking about. They completely miss the mark. Religion emphasizes the external with the neglect of the internal. Religion majors on minors and minors on majors. And now he goes to the next woe, and he said, religion loves public status. Boy, does it. He said, woe to you, Pharisees. You love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Wow. The place of honor. The chief seats in the synagogue were put in the front. Amazing. Church never got over this. Did the same thing. I can remember in Pennsylvania when I first started preaching in all kinds of different churches. Uh, it's pretty, pretty intimidating. They had in the front, usually, gigantic chairs. I mean, just gigantic. And my job, because I was a preacher, was to go to sit in one, you know? And you all sit out there with all the little people. And then I sit in what they called the deacon's chair at that time. But you sit up front so everyone can see who you are. Really? You sit up there so, you, so everyone knows who you are. But it gets, a, it gets a whole lot worse than that. Uh, they love chief, chief, the chief seats, the front seats. They love elaborate outfits. Does that change? Oh, not at all. Wow, robes. I mean, some of the robes are Reverend Knight kind of robes. You know, I mean, robes. Hats. What do you see in the Word of God? Hats. I mean, they got hats that are amazing. Why do they have a hat like that? Because you don't. We're different than you. You see, look at my hat. Look at my robe. Collars. You see, I have to wear a collar. Why? Well, so you know who I am. I thought God knew who you were. Jesus looked just like the disciples. He didn't wear special stuff. This is amazing what ends up happening here. How we love public status. Hmm. I want to read something before I go to the last one. I want to go back to Matthew 23. And I want you to follow this with me with a whole lot more of what Jesus says. Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. Now, he's, this time Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. He's speaking to everybody. Now, you have to understand, the disciples were afraid of them, and the crowds adored them. Jesus said, I want to get this all straight right now. He said, the scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. They believe they're the leader of the nation. They are not. They represent the nation, but they are not the leader. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things they do not do them. <laughs> you see, what's the problem with religion? It's in that verse. Religion is always hypocritical. Always hypocritical. Can't help it. 
He said, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, and they themselves are unwilling to move with them so much as a finger. He says, but they do all their deeds and to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen their tassels of their garment. That's from the Old Testament. I can make myself look even better than a normal person could have in the Old Testament. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. So you know who I am. And respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called the rabbi by men. It's interesting. He said, but do not be called rabbi. I find that fascinating. But one is your teacher, and you're all brothers. Be careful with that. Now look what Jesus says next. Do you think the church got this? Do not call anyone on earth your father. Could he be clear? Is there anything clearer to say than that? Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Could it be clearer than that? We have hundreds of millions of people, father, you're my father. Jesus said, don't call anyone father. No, he's my father. I haven't for many, many years, but in the beginning, and I used to stand at the door, I was actually called father by some people that visited, which is a little odd. But the idea of recognition, he said, do not. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that's Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. That's the principle of God. Jesus said, look, if you want to lead, you have to serve. If you want to be first, you have to be last. You see, it's exactly the opposite of religion. Exactly the opposite. If you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. You exalt yourself, God says, I'll humble you. Who are we to exalt ourselves? All you and I are sinners saved by grace. That's all we are. There's there's no other way to describe us than that. And Jesus said, there's no place for this. Exaltation has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Even the whole idea of Christ coming himself. He humbled himself all the way down to becoming a man and then a servant and then going to the cross and dying. It was all humility, and he was God incarnate. And here we are exalting ourselves. So after he says that, he rolls right in. Woe to you, there are eight of them in here. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go into it. Do you know what religion does in this context? It keeps people away from the Lord. That's what he's saying. Religion will keep people out of heaven. And it's been doing that for a couple thousand years. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses for the pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you receive greater, he says, condemnation. You take advantage of people. Thirdly, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. You think there's a little bit of bluntness here? That's as straightforward as he could say it. You know what you are? You're your father the devil. You're sons of hell. And you make other people sons of hell. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold in the temple, you're obligated. They had all kinds of ways of making, of swearing. You just change the wording, and if I say I swear by the temple, I don't really have to keep it. But if I said I swore by the gold of the temple, that's different. I'd have to keep it. Jesus, like, remember, he said, look, you let your yeas be yeas and your nays, nays. You can't play this game. He said, you fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that has sanctified the gold? Come on, that's even illogical. Whoever swears by the altar, that's nothing. Whoever swears by the offering, he's obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple, swears by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by the heavens, swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Every time you swear, you swear to God. 
period. There is no other way to swear. Even if you say, I swear in my mother's grave. Okay, there's no value to that. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You tied the mint and dill and the cumin, neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things that you should have done without neglecting any others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, you swallow a camel. Just amazing, vivid words. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that in the outside you may clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombstones. On the outside you appear beautiful, but you are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. So do you too outwardly appear righteous to men but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adore the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had been living the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. He says, you testify against yourselves, you are their sons. Those are the ones who murdered the prophets. He said, do you know who always killed the prophets? Religious people. You want a sign of religious people? They kill people. Do you see anything in the New Testament of Jesus and his followers ever saying, if you don't agree with me, we'll kill you? Ever? Ever? Well, the church's history has been for 2,000 years. They kill people. They kill people who disagree with them. We'll kill you if you disagree with us. Some of those guys who were killed by the church ended up, they not only burned them at stake and killed them, then they took the grinding tools and grind up all their bones and dust into dust. Then they put them in little sacks and put them on different ships and took them to different parts of the world and the ocean and dumped them overboard. Because you disagreed with us. He said, fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? Now, the reason I'm saying this, this is, this is Jesus talking to people, and he wants to evangelize them. That's what he's doing. Now, back to Luke, and we'll look at the last one. Religion emphasizes the external, not the internal. It majors and minors, it minors and majors, and religion loves public status. And a very sad one, religion corrupts others. Verse 44, he said, Woe to you, for you are like concealed tombs, and the people who walk of them, over them are unaware. Now you might say, well, what's that have to do with anything? A lot. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 21, you and I, a person in the Old Testament cannot touch a dead body. If you touch a dead body, uh, you have to go through a seven-day purification process. So you have to do a lot of purifying. That's in the Old Testament. You have to do that. Uh, also, it says in the Old Testament that uh, the Pharisees took it and said, you can't touch a grave. If you touch the grave, then you have to go through the seven-day purification process because you touched the grave. Well, one of the problems is that what do you do with unmarked graves, of which there were many? So what if I'm walking along and I step on a grave that's unmarked? Now I'm unclean. You said I didn't even know it was unmarked, but now I'm unclean, according to Pharisaic law. And I find that kind of an interesting thing. And so what Jesus is saying is, that's what you are. I'll use your analogy, your unmarked graves. You make people unclean without them even knowing it. One writer wrote this. Jesus uses this familiar thing and says, you know, you're like unmarked graves. People have no idea that they're walking all over you and being defiled all the time. People come in contact with you and they don't know it, but you're not making them holy. You're making them unholy. You're defiling them. What a terrible description of someone. That's how it is with these religious, uh, false religious leaders. They are unmarked graves and you touch them and you're defiled. And your defilement is not just ceremonial, it's spiritual. And it's not just your body, it's your soul. And it's not just ritual defilement, it's real defilement. And they are making you twice the son of hell as themselves. 
That's what Jesus said. People walk over them, they're unaware of it. You defile people. So if you think about this, religion emphasizes the external, not the internal. Religion majors on the minors, minors on the majors. Religion loves public status, and religion corrupts others. And Jesus said all this as he's evangelizing religious people. What does that mean to us? What does that mean to him? This is what I think. A religious person cannot be converted until they realize the hypocrisy of their religious activity. That's what Jesus is saying. And by the way, there were Pharisees who came. Remember the first great one that came to him, an honest man named Nicodemus. And he was the Pharisee of Pharisees, the teacher of Israel. And Jesus, he just comes in, he wants to talk to Jesus. He thinks Jesus is going to be impressed with his credentials. Jesus ignores him and says, you have to be born again. And Nicodemus said, wait, 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 what are you even talking about? I'm talking about being born again. He said, oh, you mean go back to my mother's womb? You know the whole story. But after that, Jesus is not so kind. The rich young ruler saying that when he deals with religious people, what he's come away with is you will not accept the gospel until you realize that there's a hypocrisy in your religion. You see, until you realize there's an hypocrisy in your religion. What an interesting thing. I don't know if we can learn from that, you know, because we're not Jesus. You know, he has an authority we don't have. But I do think this, it's very interesting that Christ was, when you hear, see him with a woman caught in adultery, when you see him with a he's unbelievably patient. When he's with religious leaders, he is not. He is not. Simply because they do so much more damage, not just to themselves, but to everybody else. Let's pray. Father, the words of Jesus seem harsh to us, but knowing who he is, we know they're not. Jesus has seen his own country, Israel, where he was their Messiah, totally taken away from God and put in the hands of religious men. He had seen what religion had done to his own people. And Father, he pronounces these woes on them. We all have a tendency, Father, to become religious with certain things. May we be warned that anything that doesn't originate in our inside is not of you. May we dedicate our lives to loving you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbors as ourselves. May we live by that axiom and those commandments. And Father, may we, when we witness to very religious people, May we do what Jesus did in maybe a different way, but to simply try to get them to realize the hypocrisy of outward religious activity. We do this, Father, for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name, amen.